Good morning, church. Today we are reading Daniel chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And the four great beasts came out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then, as I looked at its wings, were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side, It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back, and the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which the three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed, and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the cloud of heaven there came one like the Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed." As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for ever and ever. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet, and about the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn that came up, and before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth, and that spoke great things, and that seemed greater than all its companions. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth which shall be different from all the kingdoms and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom 
fifteen kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hand for time, times, and half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away, to be consumed and destroyed at the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, my colour changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. That's the word of God. Father, we do thank you for this word. We do acknowledge that this is part of your holy written scripture. And we pray now, Father, that you would give us attentive ears, minds of understanding. Father, and that we might also be encouraged by these words and not alarmed by them. Father, we do ask these things because we do want long to accurately hear what you have been saying to your church throughout the ages. And so help us, I pray, in Christ's name. Amen. Um, the passage just written for us uh, is a prophecy. It is a prediction of the future uh, from Daniel's um, point of view onwards. And predicting the future can become a hot mess. Predicting the future can become quite a hot mess. Predicting the future is uh, exciting to some people, and others are vaguely intrigued by the idea, and yet others among us are quite skeptical about the idea of predicting the future. For the skeptical, those of us who are just a little bit um, dubious about this idea that we can predict the future, we see the, um, we see the peddling of prophecy as little more than speculation. And this is somewhat understandable. We, uh, the, if, you're, if you read Daniel chapter 7 and you're like, this, this is crazy talk, I don't know what's going on here. Um, the reason we become skeptical about biblical prophecy is because we've lived through all kinds of predictions of the future and have just grown skeptical about them. Maybe you're old enough and you lived through the Y2K idea, right? That um, at the eve of 1999, every computer in the world was going to crash and we were all going to be in a state of anarchy by the dawn of 2000. Well, that never happened. Or perhaps you've been accosted by some religious doomsdayer, the loudmouth people who use the Bible to tell you that the end is nigh. Maybe that was a something that happened to you and you just think, man, there's just no way we could possibly dabble with predicting the future. Wherever you find yourself, whether you're reasonably curious or cynical, would you be willing to take a fresh look, a fresh look at a prediction of the future found in this chapter of Daniel? Would you be willing to take a fresh look at a prediction of the future found in Daniel 7. And maybe, just maybe, we would discover that Bible predictions like these about the future are not meant to wear us thin as tiresome speculation. Rather, that glimpses at the future steadies the community of God's people in this fundamental truth, that God is fully in control and is fulfilling his plan 
to build his everlasting kingdom. And that is the basic truth that we want to land on as we interpret Daniel chapter 7. And I start with this big statement because as we've worked through Daniel so far, we now come to a series of visions and prophecies given by God to, the people, to his people in Old Testament times. So keep in mind, at the time that these visions were originally received, when Daniel first gave word that he had a vision, he had some kind of prophecy, some kind of prediction about what's going to happen in the future, these people that first heard this were God's people in exile from their homeland. They had been in exile for nigh on 70 years, and perhaps they were wondering if God had now forgotten them. Did God wipe his hands from us? Did he forget us altogether? We've been in this exile for some 70 years now. Perhaps they're wondering that if, if they as a community would ever see Jerusalem again. We've been exiled from our land. It seems like God's forgotten us. Will we ever see Jerusalem again? A city which represented the place where God was establishing his visible dominion here on earth. That is how they recognized Jerusalem in Old Testament times. It was a signal that God was establishing his visible dominion here on earth. And the city was a representation for them that that truth is being realized. All these kinds of questions are being answered in this prophecy. Questions about, had God forgotten us? Will we ever see God's kingdom established here on earth? All these kinds of questions are answered in this prophecy chapter so this prophecy is given to help daniel and the generations following him to understand that god is fully in control and building his everlasting kingdom just a quick note then for what's coming in the next few weeks we're mainly thinking about the successive visions which deal with the geopolitical events covering about 600 years. Um, we're talking about uh, uh, prophecies that were given to um, disclose what was going to happen between Daniel's lifetime and the lifetime of Jesus. In our chapter this morning, Daniel 7, this is the overview chapter. This covers um, the whole time period in one broad stroke. One broad stroke. All the events are covered in one broad stroke. And as Jess read the chapter, there may be some of you who have noticed clearly the similarities between Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 2. Though they differ slightly in their symbolism, they do tell us about the same series of events. Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 are companions to one another. They um, fit together nicely like a puzzle. In Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream which peeked into the future, revealing to him his great empire, the Babylonian Empire, would eventually be surpassed by the Medo-Persian Empire. And that empire would in turn be surpassed by the Greek Empire. And the Greek Empire would eventually be surpassed by the Roman Empire. Four consecutive empires is what's being talked about in both Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. At the end of which, God sets up his own kingdom. None of this is controversial. None of these features about these four successive human empires is controversial or speculative. This is, um, this is basic history that you'll find if you do a bit of re reading in history. Um, you can safely Google these details for yourself. This is, um, I'm not making things up here. Um, the Babylonians were surpassed by the Persians, surpassed by the Greeks, surpassed by the Romans. That's, a, that's basic history. And Daniel chapter 7 reaffirms or repredicts the same succession of empires. As Sinclair Ferguson commented, there seems to be an obvious relationship between Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Daniel's vision. In both cases, there is a fourfold progression of the kingdoms of this world. In both cases, God establishes his kingdom in a dramatic fashion. And that's what I want us to see then in this chapter. 
Daniel 7 is a reprediction of these successive empires with God's kingdom, the kingdom of Christ, appearing as the final kingdom. You have four kingdoms of mankind and then surpassed by the kingdom of Christ. And conveniently, I know this is where we're heading because conveniently, verses 17 and 18 tells us this is where we're going. <laughs> it tells us this is exactly what Daniel chapter 7 is about. Verses 17 to 18, give us the TLDR, didn't, didn't read, uh, too long, didn't read summary of the passage. These four great beasts, it says, are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. That's the, <laughs> that's the summary of Daniel chapter 7. Four kings arise um, and then the saints inherit the final kingdom. That's the structure of Daniel 7. So this is what Daniel's vision reveals. Four kingdoms followed by the kingdom of Christ. And if that's, if that's how the text explicitly tells us to read the passage, we have to interpret the passage accordingly. We can't just make stuff up and put bits in here. We have to interpret this according to the details given in the text. Uh, it's clearly said that four beasts will arise and then the saints will inherit the kingdom. That's, that, is, um, that is the outline we have to follow when we're interpreting Daniel 7. In verse 2, Daniel said, I saw in my, night, in my vision by night, and behold, four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up out of the sea. The great sea, the great sea are nations of the world. I want to, this is just an interpretive step that I want us to make. Um, the great sea spoken of here are the nations of the world. Elsewhere in scripture, we have this exact same imagery of the sea as depictions of nations. The sea is a depiction, a symbolic depiction of nations. Isaiah said, oh, the raging of many nations, they rage like the raging sea. The many nations rage like the raging sea. The sea is the nations. So the great sea are nations, and the great beasts that Daniel saw coming out of these nations are kings. The beasts that come out of the sea, the beasts that come out of the nations are kings. We know this because verse 17 explicitly told us these four great beasts are four kings. These great beasts are the four kings. And this is what Daniel saw. Four notable kingdoms rising up out of the nations. These kingdoms are represented for us in symbolic form. How do we know who these four great kings, who these kings of the nations are going to be? Well, Daniel tells us in symbolic form. It gives us symbols by which to recognize them, much like a um, a black horse on a yellow background symbolizes Ferrari for you, or the way that a silver fern symbolizes the All Blacks for us. The symbol represents something else. The symbol is a stand-in for another reality. And so this is what Daniel does for us. Daniel describes the four kingdoms by way of symbols. He tell, What is their badge? What is the thing that, um, that uh, if you looked, you would go, oh yeah, you're talking about Babylon, or you're talking about Persia. What is the thing that makes, what is the symbol that makes us think about those kingdoms? And he gives us four of those symbols. He gives us a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a fourth beast, which he simply described as terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong, and it had ten horns. Th these are your symbols. These are your badges um, that you are supposed to recognize in history. The sequence of empires can be traced out in history, however. These are not, these are not speculative symbols that we're supposed to, um, um, that, that we just have to go guessing what they could be. That's not it. They, it. These are real symbols that can be found in history. It maps well, the glove fits. The lion, 
the lion, which is an archaeologically verifiable symbol of the Babylonian Empire. So we have the first kingdom in place. Who was the lion with the, with the wings? Well, you, you go digging in Babylon, you're going to find the symbol. Um, if you look up the Ishtar Gate, um, the symbol is all over it. Babylon is represented by the lion with the wings. The bear represents the Medo-Persians. And interesting, uh, Daniel tells us that the bear was raised up on one side. It, it's such an odd thing to put in the text. There's this bear, but it's kind of like up on one side. What does that mean? Well, isn't it interesting? It, when in, in this union between the Medes and the Persians, uh, th this, it's a union um, empire, in the union between the Medes and the Persians, the stronger of the two were the Persians. The Persians dominated. In, in that sense, it raised the bear up on one side. It was not an even-footed bear. It, one side was stronger than the other. And the Persians were always stronger than the Medes. Thirdly, we have this leopard, which symbolizes the Greek empire. And the final beast, the one with ten horns, I do think fits with what we know about the Roman Empire. The fourth beast with the ten horns is the Roman Empire. As a slight aside, I want to explain why I think this final beast matches what we know about the Roman Empire. I want to um, explain how, how did I reach that conclu conclusion today. The empire is said to have ten horns. So, sorry, I should catch you up. The empire is said to have ten horns. And a horn in this context is typically something royal or strong, like kings or rulers. To uh, A horn in scripture is often something strong, like a, a king or a ruler. And reading history, and we begin with Julius Caesar, at the time, um, Julius Caesar r ruled Rome at a time when it was transitioning from being a republic toward an empire. So, and he's widely credited for um, initiating that, that switch between a republic and an empire. So if you begin counting um, for 10 horns, for 10 rulers, beginning with Julius Caesar, you have these 10 rulers until the kingdom of Christ is properly established. Um, from the time that it's an empire, from Julius Caesar, till the time that the kingdom of Christ is properly established, and we can roughly say 70 AD, you have 10 rulers, you have 10 horns. Consider, there was Julius Caesar, and he's credited for establishing the Roman Empire. You have Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Galba, Otho, Vitellius, and Vespasian. You have these ten rulers of Rome until the time in 70 AD when the kingdom of Christ is firmly established. In any case, my point is simply that history records Romans' ten rulers, the ten horns, which Daniel predicted hundreds of years beforehand with eerie accuracy. Isn't it interesting that hundreds of years before Rome was even on the scene, Daniel predicts that there will be these ten rulers until the time of Christ's kingdom. I find that quite interesting. I find that quite crazily accurate. And what makes this all even more interesting and eerie is that one of these ten horns was a little horn. One of the ten horns is a little horn, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. Now you have a little horn, and before him, three of the horns are plucked up by the roots. Now, this is interesting, because history tells us that there were three Roman emperors who were all plucked up by the roots, who were all assassinated, <laughs> murdered one way or another, to make way for Nero to rule Rome. The, the three emperors before Nero were all assassinated to make way for Nero. And this is why I think Nero best fits the description of the little horn. Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, these were all murdered, assassinated, knocked off, um, done away with in one way or another to make way for Nero. Three horns plucked up by the roots, just as Daniel foresaw in a vision 
hundreds of years before the event. And that kind of detail, I mean, if, if, if what I'm saying here is true, if this is accurate about history, that kind of detail must surely intrigue you. You must surely go, it, how on earth could Daniel have possibly known that some, some 600 or so years before the events? How could you be so accurate in your prophecy? There is, however, one final point that really locks in Nero as the top contender for the little horn. There is one final detail that makes Nero the top candidate for the little horn. Notice in verse 25, the little horn is to wear out the saints of the Most High. The little horn is to wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times in the law and, he shall, and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. The little horn would make war against the church, that is the saints of the Most High. So the little horn will make war against the saints of the Most High but only for a very specific period of time. He will make war on the church, but only for a very limited and specific period of time. And the word time here is generally agreed to mean a year. Uh, the word time in this context, would, would, as it's widely agreed, is a year, is what's being specified here. So time, times, and half a time would work to three and a half years. Do you, do, you, do you see how that works? You've got time singular, times plural, that makes three, and half a time, three and a half years. It is known that Nero's persecution of the early Christian church started sometime in 64 AD, probably the latter part of 64 AD, a few months after he blamed a devastating fire in Rome on the Christian church. Um, it, it is widely suspected that Nero set fire to Rome to make way for his building projects, burnt entire suburbs to the ground, and when the citizens were upset, he blamed the Christians, and therefore um, also started a, a persecution campaign against the Christians. And that persecution campaign started sometime in 64 AD, probably the latter part of it, and ended at Nero's death in 68 AD, June 68 AD. And would you believe it? That comes to almost exactly three and a half years. That the little horn was wearing out the saints of the Most High for three and a half years time, times, and half a time. Look, we do have to make these interpretive steps in the scriptures, but I don't mean to lose you in the, in the details of it all. I don't mean to lose you in the details. My point is simply to show how accurately this vision of Daniel maps onto history. He gives a vision 600 years before the events and then, you, and then we, as um, those who live after these events, can go back and go, why is it that that hand fits in that glove so well? Why is it so snug? Why does it fit so accurately, right? That's the idea here. Daniel maps out, or Daniel predicts things that we can trace exactly onto the record books. And if that's the kind of accuracy you have in the scriptures, this has happened several hundred years before the event, one of the things I'd like to ask you is this. How do we explain that? <laughs> how do you explain that to someone? That the Bible has this eerie accuracy about its prophecies. How do you explain that unless there was some kind of information given to Daniel outside of his own experience and, and capacity and his own ability? What if this really is the vision that was given to Daniel by God and that that is the only real explanation we have on the table for why Daniel could see and predict the future with such accuracy? that surely it must be a prophecy given by God to the man of God. And this would also help explain 
Um, if this is true, if this really is a vision given to Daniel by God, and I believe it is, that also helps explain um, the eerie accuracy because it tells us that God alone is fully in control of all history and is fulfilling his plan to build his everlasting kingdom. The only way that this could be predicted with this kind of accuracy if the person who gives the prediction knows exactly what's going to happen. And God is the giver of this vision. He is the giver of this gift to Daniel. And he knows what's going to happen. He's in control. And he is establishing his kingdom forever. Now as thought-provoking as this vision may be, the vision is not primarily given to us to identify Nero as the little horn. Rather, the vision has a lot to say about a kingdom which surpasses the Roman Empire. Um, more is said here about the, the, the empire that comes after Rome rather than the empires leading up to Rome. So let's have a look at verses 9 to 12 together. Daniel said, As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. And as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. The picture here is of God as judge. He's entering his courtroom for a sentencing hearing. The, um, the thrones are set and the Ancient of Days come. God is entering his courtroom and he is there for a sentencing hearing. He is there to sentence Nero. Nero is sentenced to death and all rulers who follow him are exceedingly limited in their ability to wield their power. But what comes next? So, so Daniel is, is sentenced to death. Um, the uh, all earthly powers are then severely limited in their ability to rule. But what comes next? What comes after this event? Look at verses 13 and 14 with me. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. I am going to move quickly here. In the New Testament, Jesus tells us that this passage is about him. <laughs> Jesus um, says that this passage in Daniel is, I, I'm the person being spoken about here. Jesus identified himself as the Son of Man in Mark 10.45. And further, he tells us what this cloud of heaven imagery is really about. He tells us how we ought to understand the cloud of heaven imagery here. In Matthew 24.30, Jesus tells us this imagery of Daniel has to do with his ascension to heaven. Jesus, uh, Daniel was talking or envisioning Jesus going to heaven. Mark it down. Daniel is explicitly clear here. The Son of Man, with the clouds of heaven, came to the Ancient of Days. He came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. This is going to God's throne language. This is not coming from God's throne language. This is presentation to God imagery. It is not presentation from God imagery. In short, Daniel saw in his vision Jesus and Jesus ascending to heaven. And perhaps think of that ascension as a royal coronation service. Um, this is a king that's being installed into his office. At which point, God the Father gave God the Son a kingdom to rule. God the Father gives God the Son his kingdom to rule. And this echoes the royal coronation images we find throughout the scriptures, where God, speaks, uh, where God the Father speaks to the Son and says, Sit at my right hand 
until I make your enemies your footstool. Jesus goes to, uh, Jesus ascends to the Father, to the throne room of the Father. The Father says, take a seat. I'm going to make your enemies your footstool. Sit there until that is done. Sit there until your kingdom is fully established. It is Jesus' royal coronation being talked about here by Daniel. He is ascending in the clouds and being presented to the Ancient of Days. So whatever else we can say about the vision or prophecy of Daniel 7, we must surely be intrigued by the sheer accuracy of this visionary sequence of events and how they trace out in the historical record. From the Babylonian Empire to the Medo-Persian Empire to the Greeks to the Romans. But in the end, in the end, even though all the bits fit, in the end, the only empire that matters, the only empire that endures, is the kingdom of Christ. That is the only empire that is the everlasting empire. And this is no flight of fancy or mere pipe dream of Christendom. This is not a pipe dream that we're talking about here, that Christ's kingdom is the everlasting kingdom. This is what we pray for in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come. This is what Daniel actually prophesied. To him, that is to Christ, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. This is the song of the psalmist who sings, All the families of the nations shall worship before you. This was the doctrinal and evangelistic bedrock of the New Testament church who believed God has highly exalted Jesus and bestowed on him a name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And this is what Christians long to celebrate in the fullness of time when we shall all sing the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. This is what Daniel foresaw in his vision, where he reminds us that even in seasons of geopolitical um, upheaval, even in seasons where the, where the politics don't look like the kingdom of Christ is the thing being established, like living under the reign of Belshazzar, as Daniel did, and when earthly rulers make unrighteous rules, like the time of Darius when he prohibited prayer. Even in all that, even when the geopolitical landscape doesn't quite look like the kingdom of Christ is succeeding here in this world, it is. The Old Testament church was thoroughly assured by this vision of Daniel that God is fully in control and fulfilling his plan to build an everlasting kingdom. And it is this kingdom where Christ is named and respected as king that the Christian church now belongs. It is to that kingdom that the church belongs. Christ, the cornerstone, has been placed. The foundations have been poured in the teaching of the prophets and the apostles. The brickwork has been steadily going up from one generation to the next as the church has been built by Christ. And this is what makes the Christian church so important. Clearly, not everyone in the world, your neighborhood or even your family, um, will acknowledge or knows that Christ is the rightful king and his kingdom is the only kingdom which now matters. Our mission as a church, therefore, is to do just that, making the kingdom of Christ known. And Jesus commissions his church to do exactly that. Because all authority is now Jesus's. Because all authority, wherever you look, all authority in heaven and on earth, everywhere you look, all authority is now his. He tells his church to go and make disciples of the nations. Go and disciple the nations because they are mine already. I have taken the nations as my inheritance, as my gift when I ascended to the Lord. That is his gift. The nations belong to Christ. And the church brings people into the kingdom of Christ by means of word and sacrament, teaching the nations how to respond and to live with Jesus as their legitimate king. 
No doubt, this mission is long-term. You, you might be thinking, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree here. This will never happen. This mission, we have to take the long view of it. We have to take a millennia-long view of it. It is multi-generational, and it stretches from the time of Christ onwards. But consider how far we've actually come. Consider how much more of the world today is actually shaped by the Christian worldview and Christian expansion than it was 500 years ago. How much more of the world has come into the dominion of Christ now than it did 500 years ago? Or the 500 years before that? Or the 500 years before that? The church has been on a riot through the world in 2,000 years. We have been all over the place bringing nations into the dominion of Christ. It is remarkable what the Christian church has, has achieved in a mere 2,000 years. And the job is not done yet. Recently, one British historian, he wrote a best-selling book. He called, uh, it's titled Dominion. And he outlined the way that Christianity gave birth to Western civilization and continues to reshape and reform civilizations wherever it touches down. And he says there, as a researcher, he says, today the power of Christianity remains as alive as it, as it has ever been. It is manifest in the great surge of conversions that has swept Africa and Asia over the past century. This is the point of the passage, to teach God's people that God is fully in control and building his everlasting kingdom. Let me pray for us.